Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another episode of the Felony Friday podcast here on Lions of Liberty. This is a weekly show that we put on every single Friday where we try to focus on and show the injustices in the broken criminal justice system. During today's show, I'll be welcoming another member of the Lions of Liberty Pride into the virtual Lions of Liberty studio, and we'll be analyzing some newsworthy felonies from the past few weeks. If you'd like to follow along at home, you can do that on the show notes page. You can find that at lionsofliberty.com slash FF16. I'll post all the links to everything we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a bunch of different stories, a bunch of different felonies, We'll be analyzing them, so it's probably best to go and read them yourself so you can follow right along. So now let's introduce my co-host for today, my partner for the day. Uh, It is Mr. Brian McWilliams. Brian, as you know, here on Lions of Liberty, is best known for his work on the now-retired show, unfortunately, Rand Pluses and Minuses, Mm. where he and co-host Mark Clare provided weekly grades during Rand Paul's presidential campaign. Brian is also one of the co-founders of Lions of Liberty. He's an all-around funny guy. I think he's the self-proclaimed king of puns, and he even gets paid, I think, to tell jokes on stage. So that's kind of nice. Brian, welcome back to Felony Friday. Thank you, sir. Yeah, poor Rand Pluses and Minuses. It was a fantastic program. Well, we're going to try to bring it back here and there. You know, we uh, we were talking about different ways, McAfee or... uh, it goes, what the heck did I even know? I can't remember my own pun I made. No, oh, McAfee or Hackafee. That's it. <laughs> what was the one for Gary Johnson? I think it's just Johnson in or out. Mark did that one, though. Johnson in or Don't out. Don't attribute that trash to my punditry. <laughs> By the way, I think you should have a different intro to the show. You know how Mark does? He does his, are you ready to roar? You can be like, are you ready to commit a felony discussion? Just, then <laughs> Could be, be like, good. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to test it on the uh, the audience yeah, there, see good. if they like it. I'll run some split testing, see which does better. Fire a gun in the air. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, don't yeah. even go to jail. No. <laughs> Let's avoid that. No, no one go to jail. Let's stay out of jail. <laughs> good to be so, back. So, Brian, I, I feel like I don't get to talk to you that often. We used to be doing those when we were in the uh, prime debate season. We were doing those GOP debate uh, round tables, it seemed like every freaking three days. So it's good to good to talk to you and good to talk to you out of that ridiculous clown show forum. You too, my friend. You too. So let's just get into this right away. We got five different stories that we want to talk about. So I'm going to start with the first one. This is actually from, well, I guess I should say, first of all, if this is your first time listening to the show, or maybe you listened last week and you heard an interview type format. We really have two different formats on the show. This is kind of a a back and forth, more conversational. Brian and I will talk through these different stories, talk about these different felonies, give our opinions. And uh, the interview show is pretty much a straight interview. And there's really no rhyme or reason to (laughs) when we decide to run them. Uh, But this week will be a a conversation. And we're going to start out talking about a high school student who started a hit list and had a rifle on layaway who was arrested. So this was uh, in Van Buren County. The uh, sheriff there was told about a 18-year-old student, Jacob Kerrigan. I think I'm saying his name right. He was cited for recent behavior, uh, which included the creation of this hit list. So authorities were notified by the Clinton County High School principal, Frank McMurray, after a teacher became aware of a conversation with this Jacob Kerrigan that he allegedly had with his girlfriend. And Kerrigan allegedly told his girlfriend hey, wouldn't it be funny if I showed up to graduation and started shooting? So that's uh, not very funny at all, of course. Authorities learned that Kerrigan also had this hit list of names. Apparently what he did is he went around the school asking students if they thought that he was rude. And then I guess, well, he was still standing there right in front of them. He then placed either a check mark or an X next to their name, depending on their response. Now, an affidavit shows that when Kerrigan asked one student if he thought that he was rude, the student replied, saying, no, not really. And Kerrigan then told the student that he was safe. And on top of this all, a student who works at a local gun shop says that Kerrigan had an AR-15 on layaway at the shop. So Kerrigan's been suspended. He's been charged with a uh, felony, charged with falsely communicating a terrorist threat, which is a Class B felony. 
So, Brian, first question that comes to my mind right away, this guy didn't hurt anyone. He didn't aggress against anyone. Are his rights being violated by him being suspended and charged with this felony, or, or is there some merit here? You know, that's what I have been struggling with myself. Well, you know, when you sent me the article initially to look over, I was just, you know, I was torn because on one side, yeah, he didn't do anything. Not yet, anyway. And, and you know, asking kids around school if they think he's rude or not and checking him off and making a, a bad joke isn't grounds for somebody to be suspended, charged with a felony necessarily. Now, what does make it a little bit more interesting is that, you know, he had this rifle on layaway and you start adding those pieces up and you can see where the police could definitely say there's smoke here. There could be fire. We want to get in front of it. But this also gets a little bit. With, you know, if you take that charge out that says, you know, he was, I guess, threatening a terrorist act, which is debatable and something that can be taken in passing. But if you take that out of the equation, you say, is this in the, in the pre-crime region of, well, we're just going to nip this in the bud, even though we don't have any proof that anything was really going to happen. So I'm torn myself on it. Yeah, it, it is a tough one. And I'm assuming it didn't say in the article if this was a, a public or private school. I'm just going to assume it's a public school. So that kind of makes it more of a wishy-washy issue. If it was a straight up private school, if he had violated the rules that they had there, they could just boot him out. And this public school, I'm guessing they're public, has suspended him. I mean, legally, I'm not sure if these charges will stick or if this is the right way to go about it. You know, he hasn't carried out any crimes um, as sick as it is to say, or allegedly that he said to his girlfriend, what if I showed up at graduation and started shooting? That could be just a terrible joke. You know, there is a First Amendment in this country, a right to free speech. So we got to be careful here that we're not infringing upon that free speech. This kind of reminds me a little bit, we talked about a couple weeks ago, back on episode 12 of Felony Friday, where in Colorado they had uh, a law that, or they were trying to enact a law similar to this, where if you made a threat against a college that it would be an automatic felony. And the thought process behind that had to do with the cost outlays, the, the, you know, the resources, the police department and the bomb squad that they had to, to roll out to respond to it. So a little bit different there, but I don't know. It's tough. I think this is too much. I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm not going to dance around anymore. I don't think he should be charged with a felony. Not that we're playing, is this a crime yet? But that's, <laughs> uh, that's, what, I, that's what I feel. Yeah, I don't know if he should be uh, charged with a felony either. I have another question, though, is what do we think of the police response in this situation? Because this is where I put myself in the position of saying, now, if I was him and I let's say I had a gun on layaway and I just because I was wanted a gun to protect myself, protect my interests, uh, or just because I want to look at it, it doesn't matter. But it, let's say I had a gun to the side and I'm a guy who makes a lot of bad jokes. Now, I don't make jokes where I'm just like, I'm going to go shoot people up necessarily, but I make a lot of jokes on stage and other I forums. I think you might have told that joke one time it, on it, stage. It bombed. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of pissed off that this carrying is going to be all the credit for it. Uh, no, but you know, it's you tell these jokes. And so if this got construed because of the people adding together random facts and they came after me, I would be furious. I'd say, this is definitely an infringement of my rights. But from an outside looking in, you say, well, yeah, I mean, you could understand why the police would take this action. So what is your thought on that, though? Where is that line where you say nothing has happened, but the police had to act? Do they have a right to go in and kind of do this investigation to look into this and then then take the action? I think the school, as I said, absolutely should have a right to suspend him. It wouldn't be a question if we had a, a privatized schooling system and didn't have public schools, then, a, you know, a school could just kick him out for the shady behavior going around with the list. But I really don't think that, I mean... Just because he has a gun on layaway that he's going through legal channels to get, I don't think that they should face a, a punishment for that. I'm sorry. I mean, I obviously do not want a school shooting to occur. Now that you could put some other measures in place to prevent a school shooting, you could have you could, you know the opportunity for teachers to get permits and to be armed or for administrators to be armed or to have more security in a school to deter events like this, get rid of the gun-free zones. I think that would do more to deter someone like this person acting out. But just looking at it from the outside, not knowing all the facts, I really don't think that this guy should face any punishment legally. I agree. I, I think if anything, you'd want to see counseling come into play here where they say, OK, we see there might be an issue here. We want to have you go to counseling for a little bit to kind of just look at your thought process and make sure that there's nothing deeper here that we're worried about. 
And that's what people talk about with a lot of these different cases, you know, mental health, quote unquote. And I don't advocate for anybody being denied a gun based upon their mental health status. But just in general, you think, why don't you have a step between charging this kid with a felony and have him go to counseling or have him talk to anybody else before you slap him and potentially ruin his life? So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I don't want to dwell on this one too long because we do have a lot more to talk about, but you, you just brought up the mental health and that reminded me of the lost libertarian debate episode that got lost in, in the, uh, I don't know, in the interweb somewhere <laughs> with, we had some technical difficulties a couple of weeks ago recording it. And I'm talking about mental health. You know, people say we need to keep guns away from people with mental problems, people that are unstable. And I mean, when you really think about it, do they not have the same rights to protect themselves as us just because they have these problems? Is their life not worth as much as ours? That's really where I have a problem with these pre-crime laws. And it's on both sides, Republicans, Democrats, and all in between. People say, unquestioning it, of course we got to keep guns out of people that have mental health problems. I mean, I don't know if that's morally right. I honestly don't. I think there's other ways to deal with it. Getting rid of gun-free zones, um, letting people concealed carry you know, in every state if they want to. I think that's more of a help, but I don't want to dwell on this too long. Well, I'll say one thing on the mental health okay. and uh, a total agreement with you. I think they should have access to them. And also that, you know, concealed carry should be legal in every state. The problem I have with the government getting involved with mental health in regards to gun rights is that Obama, when he was trying to get in the way of Second Amendment rights with his executive actions, one of the things he put out there was that he wanted to redefine mental health parity. Now, that's the government defining what is mental health. So if they're the ones responsible for defining it, it's easy for them to say, OK, well, the bar is really high for mental health where you can get a gun so they can just restrict millions and millions of Americans from getting firearms just based on, OK, yeah, an arbitrary decision on yes or no, you're, quote unquote, sane enough to own a gun. So that's it. Last, Absolutely. Last <laughs> Absolutely agree. So next story we have when a dark web volunteer gets raided by police. So. Full disclosure, I do not know much about the dark web. I'm going to try to talk my way through this story. Please don't say this guy's an idiot because he doesn't know what Tor is or or the dark web. Go read the article yourself, please. I'll do my best to walk through it, and then we'll talk this about it. This is how it. you know you're a parent. Don't know a thing about the dark web. Ugh. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah, um, these kids and their dark webs. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in the how world. How are you going to sell this kid if you want to? God, educate yourself. I don't know. I guess I got to get on the dark web. I got to figure it all out. <laughs> so uh, this is in Seattle. And the gentleman's name here, David Robinson, not of the San Antonio Spurs glory, David Robinson, a different David Robinson. His house was raided shortly after 6 a.m. in the morning. Officers came in. They had a search warrant and they demanded he hand over all his computers and passwords, which he did. The reason for the raid is Robinson was running a TOR exit relay. Hopefully I'm saying that acronym right. TOR, T-O-R, stands for the Onion Router. That's true. I didn't know that until this story. I didn't either, actually. I've never heard anybody spell it out before. But yes, you're right. TOR exit relay is correct. (laughs) Okay, I got it right. It's sometimes referred to as the dark web, of course, as we talked about. And it relies on internet connections provided by volunteers like Robinson. So how does Tor work roughly? And like I said, this probably isn't at all how it works, but somewhat. Traffic passes through the owner's computers through a Tor exit relay. The Tor relay host never sees what's going through the relay because it's encrypted. And because of the privacy that Tor allows, it's a favorite, obviously, of a lot of people who don't want to be tracked by the government, want to get away from government surveillance and uh, censorship. However, it can be used for obviously less noble purposes. And although Tor is completely legal because of these, you know, less noble acts like, say, child pornography or things that, you know, I would argue like, uh, you know, drugs, uh, marijuana, cocaine, things like that, that should be legal. A lot of that passes through these relays. So the police obviously want to track down that stuff. And Tor frustrates the heck out of law enforcement because, like I said, everything's encrypted and they can't see it. So I guess they somehow obtained or I don't know how they got this uh, child pornography image that allegedly passed through this uh, David Robinson's computer. And that gave them enough to go get the warrant from a judge and search all his computers. And of course, Robinson said, you know, I don't see any stuff that passes through. I can't see it. It's encrypted. You know, he was very frustrated by it because the police know how this process works. You know, they've been schooled on it. But yet one of the officers even said, well, you don't believe it passed through. I'll show you the image trying to show him this image of child pornography, which is ridiculous. Yeah, that's awful. And 
<laughs> it's insane. And, you know, uh, Mr. Robinson said pretty much, you know, what, what the heck's wrong with you? Why would you want to show me that? So the question here, Brian, are David Robinson's rights being violated by this search? This, you know, tour is legal. I would say 100 percent. Yes. Now, I can understand why the cops would say, OK, but we have a warrant because an image went through. We found we have an image. And probably they were Chris Hansening, somebody that they knew was a child pornographer or looked at child porn and then traced him sending an email somewhere. But knowing what tour was, they clearly know what it is. Knowing that it's going through his server, which is a tour server, I feel that his rights were completely violated. The way I want to look at this you know, is to say, OK, you have tour. You have this exit relay and it's like having a sidewalk that you permit to go across your yard. So people walk along the sidewalk all the time. You don't know what they're doing. You're inside your house. You're not paying attention. You're providing a through fare for the public good. If somebody walks along the sidewalk and looks at child porn, for instance, or uh, pulls a gun out and shoots somebody on the sidewalk in front of your property, is that in any way your problem? And I'd say no. And that to me is exactly what this is. If he doesn't know about it, he's providing a through fare. And we know for a fact he can't see what's going through there because it's encrypted. This is ridiculous. They should have no right to infringe on his liberties and they should never have raided him. That's a great example. Another example I thought of with a, a post office or maybe even better example, like a FedEx or a, uh, a DHL or something like that. You're having all these packages shipped back and forth. They come through their offices, come through their distributing channels. They, they can't see what's in it. Is it their responsibility to x-ray every package, look in it, or even open every package and see what's in there? Heck no. I mean, that's not on them. That would be insane to blame UPS or FedEx for you know having child pornography pass through their office. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I think this is the exact same thing that's happening here. Now, in this instance, too, he agreed to have the police go ahead and look at his computers and he provided the passwords. If he hadn't, that's what I'm curious to see what would happen then, because then you know what's going to happen not only is he going to be raided by the FBI for something that he had no business, had no idea what was going on, but now I would say they most likely are going to confiscate his computer. So they're going to take his personal property for God knows how long, and who knows if he'll even get it back. And as we've seen in the past with different things involved with the police, who knows what else they would have done? Who else if, would they have got after his property to try to try to have leverage on him to provide him the passwords? So there's a lot more that could have happened in the story that didn't because he was compliant and because he knew it was encrypted. But had he been a little bit more difficult, like... I don't know if I would have given the passwords. I'd probably be like, hey, why don't you stick thumbing up your asshole and get out of here? But I'm just saying it could have turned out a lot worse. So just going to point that out. It could have turned out a heck of a lot worse. I mean, someone's banging on your door at six o'clock in the morning. I know if somebody was banging on my door at six o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning or whatever, I would probably go to the door with a gun. And then I'm at the door with a gun with the police right there. I could end up shot. So, yeah, it's it's crazy. That's a good Um, point. Very good point. Could have ended up a, a heck of a lot worse. So. He was complying, and like Brian said, they didn't confiscate anything, which was nice of the police. They just searched his computers right there. And so that's one good thing about the story. The police didn't trash his uh, residence or hold his property for any period of time. That is nice. It <laughs> is nice. It's nice of them. Nice little perk. It's kind of a nice surprise. Little perk. Deal, deal, <laughs> dealing with the authorities. Little perk. Right. Okay, so now we're going to play the fastest growing podcast game show, Is This a Crime and Should Anyone Do Time? This is going to be maybe the rapid fire edition. We got three we want to get through in just about 10 minutes. So we'll try to do this. First one up here, mom facing felony charges for trusting nine-year-old to watch baby brother in her car. This is in Indiana. A mom left her nine-year-old daughter to watch her baby brother in the car when she ran into Kmart. Some busybody apparently saw this happen or walked up and saw the kids in the car and called police. The busybody did not stick around to see if the kids were okay. Did not, uh, you know, knock on the window and say everything okay or offer to wait with them. No, the busybody didn't say anything to the kids. Just called the police and got out of there. Yeah. This jerk like a just drive-by. called the cops and pulled it. This is sort of a separate issue, but this is a problem we have in society today where people just have no accountability, just call the police and, and run away. So the cops arrived and remained with the kids while the mom was still in Kmart for about 10 minutes. And then the mom came out of the store and the officers did release the kids back to their mother, which is nice of them. Again, yeah, police <laughs> being nice there. So, so, so Well, so just wait till they get a to... knock on the door two days from now from social services. They take those kids away. We'll yeah, have to follow uh, this story up. 
Scary, scary stuff. But this poor woman was charged with a, she might be charged with a level six felony neglect charge with, where that would probably end up with her kids being taken away, which would be terrible. So Brian, is this a crime and should anyone do time? Absolutely not a crime and absolutely nobody should do time for it. It is honestly one of the biggest things that pisses me off in current society is the over nannying of people. And, and this way, and you said it yourself, people make these phone calls about stuff like this where they say, oh, I'm doing a good thing. I'm going to citizen and I'm going to report this, this uh, neglect. Meanwhile, they don't know what the hell is happening. They don't know the abilities of the child watching the baby. They don't know the circumstances the mother's in. Yet they go ahead and, as you said, make a call and run away. Or as I put it, uh, they did a drive by police call, essentially. So, no, I think it's crazy. The kid is in the car with the baby. Nine years old is a pretty old age. I remember when I was nine, I, I mean, I grew up taking the bus and walking home. I walked to middle school when I was in middle school. And that's, I mean, God, I don't even know how, when you're in sixth grade, how old are you? Like 11? Maybe not even? Sounds right. Yeah, it's right around that age. So to say a nine-year-old can't competently sit in a car and make sure his baby brother doesn't choke. And if he does, he can go into the store or get help. Is, and classify that as neglect, that's felony neglect, it drives me bonkers, man. It, it just it it is something that makes my blood absolutely boil. I mean, a nine year old kid can watch a baby for 10 minutes. It's not that hard. And this isn't the middle like, of summer either. I mean, this is like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's not like the kids are baking in the car. It's not like this nine year old has to feed the baby and change it and watch it for, you know, hours upon hours. This is like 10 minutes. And this reminded me of an interview that Mark had back on uh, Lines of Liberty, episode 156 with Lenore Skenazy, the episode titled America's Worst Mom, where she told a story. And it's, it was a story somewhat like this. You know, why are you considered a bad parent when, say, you have to run to the drugstore, you have three kids, maybe they're sick, maybe one of them's sick. It's like five degrees outside. You got to run into the drugstore to pick up a prescription or some Tylenol or something. You're just running in for two minutes. Why should you have to take all your kids, you know, put their coats on, dress them up, get them out of the car, walk through the icy parking lot, walk into the store, get the prescription, walk out. It's probably more dangerous. In fact, it is more dangerous to bring them out into that cold, onto the ice, bring them into the store than it is to lock the doors in the car, park it right in front of the store, run in and come back out. Right. But we live in a society that is not rational. So we get crap like this. Well, we talked uh, earlier about pre-crime. This is basically pre-crime. Nothing's happened to these kids yet. Why can't people just leave it alone? Look, I know people want to help, of course. And if, if I see a baby in a car on a hundred degree day with all the windows up, I probably would call somebody. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm not calling somebody. I'm busting, busting out. Well, the oh, there you go. Window. Exactly. I, yeah, agreed. I would probably just crack the window myself with my elbow or something like that. You're seeing something that looks like an immediate need. Like, holy hell, I got to do something now or somebody's going to die. Meanwhile, this is pre-crime, essentially. They're calling the cops and they don't know if anything's wrong. The kids look happy. But I could have gone up, wave at the kid, kid will wave back. You're fine. But yet, let's make an action. Let's give somebody a felony neglect charge when these kids are completely fine. They've been fine. They've both in perfect health. So clearly she's raising the kids okay. And yet we got to make this decision. Like, let something happen first before you do something. If You know, it's I just, it's so crazy. It's insanity. It's insanity. On to the next one. On to the next insane one. Or actually, this one isn't really, I don't know. So this, this will be a good discussion. So this one titled Man Charged with Murder After Shooting Alleged Assailant Armed with a Pipe. Now, I brought this one up. I posted it on our private group on Facebook, the Lions of Liberty Forum. And if you were a member of our private Facebook group, you might have already read it and you'd be ready to listen to this discussion. But you can easily join our group just by going to Facebook, typing in Lions of Liberty Forum. The group will pop up and we'll approve you probably within two or three minutes unless you look, look like a psychopath in your avatar picture. <laughs> with that being said... This happened in North Carolina, and it, it's sort of a story, you know, a little bit of hearsay, maybe back and forth. It's just relying on the accounts of the shooter and the uh, people who were with the victim. OK, what happened here? The shooter, Jason Clary, says he was in the driveway of his home when three men showed up armed with pipes. Ultimately, what happened, he ended up shooting and killing one of the men. The backstory to that is he claims that they called him ahead of time and threatened him and said they were coming to kill him. So he said that he comes out of his house, sees these three men armed with pipes, and one of them charged him, and he killed him. Now, the flip side of that story, the victim's family and the people who were with this man say that he just 
they showed up because the shooter, Jason Cleary, who I guess he employed the guy who got shot, employed his son. And apparently they thought that this Clary was a bad influence on him. So they were just coming to talk to him. I mean, it is a fact that they, I mean, the metal pipes were found on the scene. So just showing up to talk to someone carrying metal pipes. Eh, I don't know. I don't really buy that. Yeah. I don't really buy that story. <laughs> so there's a little bit more to it, though. There was quite a bit of distance between the two of them. And there's a video of this, apparently. They don't say in the article who shot the video or where it came from. There was only one gunshot. And the guy died. Uh, his two friends that were with him drove him to the hospital right away, and he died on the way to the hospital. So th- this isn't totally straightforward because we obviously don't know all the facts. But with what you know, Brian, do you think this is a crime and should anyone do time? This honestly, to me, seems cut and dry, not a crime, and you should not do time. And I'll tell you why. Simply, and you already said some of it. You said that the guy showed up with pipes. There's a picture of the pipe on the ground, the guy who got shot. Once you come to someone's house and you get out of a truck with three guys carrying pipes and there's a known interaction already happening here, I don't care if you charge or not. The guy has a right to shoot you because he feels like he's in danger. I would feel like I was in danger if somebody came to my house with three guys and pipes in their hands. So, of course, I'm going to shoot at him. And you could say, oh, well, was he really in danger? What he's feeling? He felt endangered. And there was a good reason for him to feel endangered. So, no, they were on his property, shot him with his gun because he felt endangered. No crime, no felony, totally should get off. Yeah, it's a good point. And it's not like he shot him in the back. The guy wasn't running away. He was running towards him from everything I saw. He was shot in the front. And the shooter brought up a good point. He was quoted, said, you know, when do you make that decision? When a man is coming towards you with a weapon and you have one shot, there's three guys and there's one of him. When is the right time to shoot? Is it 50 feet? Is it 30 feet? It's not 10 feet. I'm not going to wait till someone gets 10 feet away from me when, when there's three of them with pipes. Yeah, I mean, it's you're just asking for trouble, showing up to someone's house, carrying a pipe. It's a recipe for someone to get shot. Exactly. So if you're looking to get shot, go to someone's house, carry a pipe. Hey, look, the United States goes to war with other countries over far less provocation than three men with pipes at our doorstep. So... He, this guy's That's perfectly true. justified. <laughs> yeah, sometimes no provocation. No provocation, just a, a rumor. <laughs> yeah, heard something, heard about some weapons of mass destruction. What'd you say there. over there, Assad? Go get him. Go get him, guys. Bring up the bombers. Go give him some weapons. Yeah. Uh, foreign policy. A topic for another day. <laughs> topic, the non-intervention debate. We'll have to do that We sometimes. do need to do that. You're going to get schooled. Yeah. Okay, so last one here. This one is a little bit funny. That's a lot funny, actually. It's actually pretty hilarious. <laughs> Drunk guy arrested after spraying bar patrons with liquid. Well, are we going to make this show, this show explicit? Maybe we will. I think with I already ass. said, I already dropped something that was slightly <laughs> risque. Not too bad. Ah, uh, screw yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> so this is in Athens, Georgia. 20-year-old guy is in a bar, just blitzed out of his mind drunk. And he's walking around spraying people with this liquid ass, this liquid flatulence spray around 2 a.m. Uh, then he you know, puts it in his pocket and goes and sits down. Authorities go and confront him and he's sitting at the bar like nothing going on and they search him and they find the flatulent spray. (laughs) And apparently he sprayed a woman in the face with this spray. So I don't know if that influences your decision here, Brian. But do you think this guy was charged with disorderly conduct, public intoxication, underage consumption of alcohol? Was there a crime here? Should this guy do any time? Well, I don't think he should do time. I do think there was a crime, though, because, look, number one, he's underage, which I might disagree with the age at which is considered proper to drink. But legally, he's underage, so he knows he shouldn't be doing that. And he's going in there. And I I mean, look, it's virtually it is an attack. I know it's with stanky ass spray, which is unfortunate, but it's still an attack. And if he's he's squirting some lady in the face, you got to who knows what ass sprays effect on the eyeballs is or can't be good. It can't be great. It can't be good. No, No, I think they're totally right. The kid should have been arrested. He should have been charged. He definitely shouldn't go to jail for something like this. But, you know, if he's got a, a fine then fine. Pay the fine, kid. Learn your lesson. You're an idiot. Yeah, maybe if it, I wish just somebody punched him in the face, that would have been a pretty good punishment. That would have been pretty solid. That's a little, we're getting a little bit into uh, Saudi Arabia law, I think. But 
Maybe. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Say if you're out with your fiance at a bar, Brian, and someone comes up to her and sprays her in the face oh, I, with some acid. I'd go spray. crazy. I'd Do you think the there's anything wrong with punching that guy? No, in the not face? at all. I, I'm just saying, as a, if we were talking official mode of, of punishment, <laughs> no, I totally agree. Yeah, I'd punch him right in the face. Yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. With that said, we're going to wrap <laughs> up the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Brian, thank you again for coming back on the show. Always it was a, a lot pleasure. of fun. And if you guys like the show, please subscribe. Subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. You can find links to both on our show notes page. Make sure to check that out. And if you like the show, please share it. Share it with a friend. Share it on email. Share it on Facebook, Twitter. However you share this, the stuff you like, please share our podcast, the Lions of Liberty podcast. This is the Felony Friday show on the Lions of Liberty podcast. As always, guys, thank you for listening again today. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning. <laughs>